Hello, everyone. I'm Patrick Murphy. I am a mechanical engineer and the director of sustainable design with Vanderwell Engineers. I'm also the resident engineer on the BSA SCUP committee. And we uh, you know, have had a lot of conversations over the past year among the SCUP committee, but also certainly I've had with my clients and our panel has had these conversations with their clients about not only how do we make our buildings uh, and specifically our building HVAC systems uh, safer to operate during you know, a respiratory pandemic, but also what do these buildings look like in the future? And how do we think of the bigger picture of health and wellness design around uh, specifically the engineering of how our buildings operate? So uh, we're really you know, pleased to have a panel of engineers to share with you uh, their thoughts on the topic. So they'll walk through uh, you know, air systems through the prisms of air filtration, uh, ventilation, airflow rates, humidity control, pressurization, uh, UV filtration, air quality monitoring, lots of ways to look at this and, and different tools and, and perspectives for making our HVAC systems um, operate and improve the health of, of our occupants. So our panel uh, is uh, three gentlemen. First is John Swift. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar. Uh, John is a partner and the science and technology practice leader for Borough Halfholds US region, has uh, more than 25 years of experience in high performance building systems engineering design. Next is Pat Duffy. He's a principal and mechanical engineer at BR Plus A with over 16 years of experience including uh, building long-lasting relationships with clients like Boston College and Northeastern. And lastly is Brian Redingswald, who is a mechanical engineer and project manager at BR Plus A with over 20 years of experience, specializing in HVAC system design for laboratory and hospital environments with a strong emphasis on sustainability and innovation. So panel, take it away. Okay, um, Pat, you're gonna start or is it me? John, I'll swap it to you. Yeah. I mean, okay, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to throw a curveball at you. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, it's uh, the HVAC aspect of, of this whole situation is very interesting and there's a lot of focus on it. Um, and so, you know, when we talk to people about, okay, when are we gonna return back to work and how are we gonna do it and how can we make, people feel like the systems are safe, right? And so there's there's a kind of a big picture perspective on it. Like how did, you know, we, when this all started, we had to think about, you know, and we had to find out about how um, the, the disease was being transmitted. And, you know, um, ASHRAE and some other organizations did a really good job of digging into it and then providing guidance. And so, you know, every type of building that we look at, it's like when we're looking at how to deal with this in different buildings, it's, you know, there's almost a different approach or a nuanced approach to each one. So next slide, please. And so, um, you know, there's kind of two levels of assessment that happens initially, right? You want to see what, you know, when you're looking at existing buildings, we want to look at, okay, what is the existing infrastructure of the building? And then we want to understand what is the existing um, air quality, uh, um, um, how it is in the building now with respect to, you know, filtration, humidity, pressurization, which is how the air is distributed, um, and uh, other types of monitoring uh, uh, devices if they're available. Next slide, please. We're going to transition to Patrick here. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things that I, I'm on a committee with an uh, organization called APA, and um, it's a lot of, of facilities, folks from universities, you know, more on the, uh, on the, um, the operation side of things. And, and it, what they were looking at doing is, is how do they put their arms around? You know, they have a lot of students and parents, as we were talking about earlier, asking is, is, is the building healthy for my son to be in or his daughter to be in? And they're trying to answer that question. And, you know, they got millions of square feet of campuses with, with lots of different buildings. So 
I think that's when we started talking about it, we're trying to, trying to, um, you know, gather our thoughts and, and share them today about how we, you know, we think uh, we've been evaluating buildings and, and, you know, moving forward, how this conversation might continue. So uh, I, you know, these next couple of slides are, are I'm borrowing from a, a presentation that um, Lindsay Marr at uh, Virginia Tech put together. And it was really a study that was done for the, how this disease is, is being transmitted within buildings. And um, so the, you know, we've got really four different types of contacts, direct contact, everybody knows you wash your hands, you know, indirect contact, you touch something, again, washing hands, the, uh, the large droplets, which um, is a six foot rule, you know, masks and six foot rule. And then this, uh, you know, fourth uh, uh, kind of category, which is really what we're, we're here today to talk about is um, airborne and aerosols. And so they did some work, uh, you know, in looking at the size of the particles and the, um, you know, when, when we breathe or sneeze or cough or, or anything, the, the particles are, are in water droplets. So COVID gets transmitted out into the air through, um, you know, uh, through water particles. And um, the actual size of the, the COVID particle is, is about 0.1 micrometers. And the, um, the size of a respiratory fluid that starts to float in the air is right around a half a micrometer. If you go to the next slide, Brian, the, uh, the reason that, that RH matters is that as you, you know, breathe out, you, the, a lot of the, the particles and the, you know, the droplets start off larger than that size. And so those are the things that fall to the, to the ground within the first six feet is what the study found. But the RH, if it, in the winter time, when the when it's drier outside, those uh, particles, if they dry out in the period of time before they're they hit the ground, they can start to you know be suspended in the air. And so the study was looking at how long would those particles, what size of those particles, and how long would they be suspended in air. So what they found was that once you get below about five micrometers, um, which you know a lot of these particles in a dry environment can do. The study found that it could be up to you know 16 hours worth of of time that the uh, that these particles are are you know kind of floating around the air. Now ASHRAE, and we'll get into this a little bit in a little bit, but ASHRAE looked at because there's there's still uh, a lot of work to be done in this you know realm of science, but ASHRAE looked at the influenza studies because nobody's looked at it yet. They've looked at what particle sizes you know and in, in the concentration within a room, you know, from, uh, from folks that, um, from the testing that Virginia Tech did, but what they're looking at on the, in the ASHRAE side is on in influenza, there were studies that said the particles had to be about one and a half micrometers in order to actually transmit enough of a, of a viral dose into, uh, into folks. So this, you know, there's just a lot to be, I think, um, to be done in, in further investigation to, uh, to really understand this further, but, but this is showing that you know the the particles can stay you know stay in the air and suspended in the air, which you know, I think is pretty logical given the fact that the uh, most of the transmission seems to be from indoors you know uh, large events and and um, it's you know these this research is is lining up with a lot of the facts that we all understand. Yeah, that's a real uh, sobering. Uh, uh, Time frame there that really puts some emphasis on our HVAC systems. Uh, uh, John, I don't know if you want to talk about you know how some of these uh, devices and placements can uh, impact uh, you know air distribution throughout the space and its effect yeah. on uh, on how they this actually can be transmitted between people. Right. So you know some buildings don't have any ventilation, and some older buildings. Some buildings have you know very simple uh, uh, um, air systems that. Are, you know, are recirculating, as you can see, where the, the dotted circle there. And the filtration in those systems sometimes is not sufficient to, to um, you know, to clean the air, to, you know, to, minif to minimize, um, you know, potential infections uh, from uh, aerosols, right? And so, um, you know, there's different ways that we've started to look at, okay, how can the HVAC system support as healthy an environment as possible, especially in the context of what we've learned about infectious aerosols. So next slide, please. So trying to you know, bring it 
you know, I mean, you saw some of the engineering and science that's going into this, but it's really under, important to be able to talk to people in lay, in lay terms about, okay, what can you do with the systems? So when we go look at existing systems and also when we're writing BODs for new projects, we're looking basically at six uh, categories. How are we filtering the air? How much fresh air are we bringing in through the space? Um, what is the humidity control um, capacity and uh, opportunity in a specific building? Because the guidance on between 40 and 60% is very hard to achieve on the low end in most buildings in cold climates. How is the air being distributed? Which we just looked at in a slide that kind of indicated that. What other treatment could you do to the air in addition to filtration to, to kill any viruses or bacteria? And then the last one, which I think is just as important is what are we doing to monitor the air after we've implemented, you know, two or three of, of the appropriate measures? How do people that are in the space know that, that those measures are actually working? You know, and so, uh, you know, all of the people that I've been talking to, we want to we be able to monitor something, whether it's just CO2 or a few other things beyond CO2 to make sure that, um, the, you know, the filtration and the fresh air uh, upgrades are actually impacting how the air is uh, being monitored and measured in the space. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, the, the controlling temperature and humidity has always been an issue with health, right? Like, so, so a lot of the things that we're looking at are things that have already started to be incorporated into healthy buildings, right? So one of the things is filtration. If you go with the MERV 13 filters, which every lead project has to do, then you're at the level that's being recommended by ASHRAE, right? And so um, that's just one example, and we have some of the slides on that, so I won't go through each uh, item, but the controlling of humidity is really the, one of the ones that drops off for most buildings in the Northeast, unless you're in a lab building or in a healthcare environment. Um, it's really hard to control the humidity in those spaces, and we'll talk a little bit about, okay, what can we do with that um, in a few slides, but um, I do want to emphasize that ASHRAE really stepped up um, and provided really strong guidance on how engineers can uh, respond you know, to this pandemic. Um, one other aspect that I think Patrick kind of alluded to earlier, and you know, there was a presentation earlier, uh, it was like last summer, Built Environment Plus sponsored it. Um, Dr. Joe Allen from Nine Foundations was one of the, um, one of the speakers. And so, you know, some of these things that we're talking about, adding filtration, bringing more outside air in, these are all things, you know, putting more humidity into buildings. These are all things that um, take up a lot of energy, right? So there's, there's a paradox about healthy buildings and healthy planet, and we have to find the right balance for how any of the, um, of the enhancements that we're going to do with HVAC systems are going to um, play in the world of sustainability. So next slide, please. And so as part of that effort, we tried to, you know, the, the people who were moder moderating that panel tried to say, okay, what are some of the things that are being done and how effective are they at mitigation? And what is the environmental impact of those things? And so this is something, this is not uh, scientific. It's just like where people thought um, different um, measures would fall uh, in this kind of, um, in this field. Um, and so this is a consideration that we'll get a lot of discussion as we move forward and you know, come out of the pandemic, but still wanna design healthy buildings that also are, are healthy for the environment. Yeah, gr great points, John. I mean, there's a lot of questions out there. You know, we need to kind of work with, uh, you know, what design trends are happening and, when, and apply those with the tools that we know that we have, we know that work that ASHRAE are recommending. So, um, you know, we know our spaces are going to continue to need collaborative space, whether that's in school, whether it's virtual, hybrid, uh, whatever the trend ends up being, but we know that's still going to be needed. And uh, so it's our job here to, you know, figure out what HVAC approach um, uh, is the best, and, and it's going to vary based on uh, you know, the data and the trends of what students and employees need, and it's going to vary based on, you know, what tools we have. So uh, the solutions will also widely vary, you know, as in the picture on the left here, are we going to end up with, you know, these little bubbles and filtered uh, cubicles, you know, inside each collaborative space? Probably not, um, but can we do better than a, 
uh, an air filter strapped to a box fan and a window. I think we can find some middle ground there. So um, it's not going to be a one size fits all, but um, I think we'll all collaborate and get there based on uh, where the trends go. Um, and it's going to depend a lot on what type of building you have. So uh, Pat was going to kind of go through a little bit of you know what we know about um, uh, existing uh, buildings of these different eras and how they play a role. Yeah, I think um, you know I think you know, Brian and John were both saying. It, and we, it, we had a discussion as we were kicking off what are we going to talk about today about, you know, what there's a lot of, of good data out there so far, but I think there's a lot that's still um, still be to be determined and, you know, part of a bigger discussion. And I think, you know, a, a part of that discussion is is how much should we be doing? You know, how much are people going to really, you know, we need to make the buildings healthy, but, you know, what how far do we go? And I think that's kind of a theme you'll you'll hear throughout this discussion as, as we go forward. And do we make the buildings all into these huge, you know, outdoor air, almost like a lab building, or, or do we find some middle ground that's that's kind of more sustainable? Um, so as we talked about the different types of buildings on a campus, you know, you everybody knows you got the, the older buildings, the original buildings of the campus where they might've had, they were built for heating, but there was, you know, little to no ventilation put into them. Um, so you might have a steam radiator. Some of those buildings might have been retrofitted with some small, you know, ventilation systems. But the, you know, the architecture of the buildings just, you know, they don't, uh, they're not made for for large amounts of air to be moved throughout the building. And then, you know, we we came up with the other category, which was kind of the the 1960s to 1990s buildings, which tend to be a little less ventilated. Um, have you know, a part of this era was was where the sick building kind of syndrome came into play. Um, and then we had kind of the super size uh, version of a building, which was like the 1990s when energy was cheap and and um, more was better. So we had a bunch of VAV systems and these buildings are actually, you know, pretty, pretty well adaptable because of, of the amount of outdoor air that's in them. Um, from a sustainability standpoint, there's probably been a lot of things. Those have been a focus for for a lot of campuses, and a you know a target for energy reduction. But uh, the kind of the bones of of those buildings are are probably you know more or less pretty well adaptable. So we try to think of a you know what the approaches might be for each of these different types of buildings. Um, you know, thinking of putting ourselves in the shoes of of the campus uh, campus facilities folks. Yeah, uh, great points, Pat. I mean, so like you said, with the newer era buildings, those 1990s, they've got, you know, big, you know, supersized ventilation systems. A lot of them have, um, you know, the ability to, you know, mix the, the air effectively. Some of them don't, some of them have been upgraded. Um, so we're, you know, kind of going to focus a little bit of time here on the major challenges with the older existing buildings, which, you know, everybody has on their campuses and what do you do? Um, so one of those primary areas of concern is the, the ventilation system. Obviously, that's the big one. Um, the systems don't have a lot of distribution and uh, where they do, as John said, it's you know kind of a, a poor system. If, if you've got you know one supply air duct blowing you know from one corner of the room and it you know it may, it may more effectively transmit a virus from one person to the person sitting behind them if it's not a, a well fully mixed uh, type space. So uh, that's the challenge we're dealing with in a lot of these older buildings and um, you know the distribution, the, the lack of fresh air and uh, poor filters um, and the inability to uh, replace filters uh, if your fan system can't handle the extra uh, pressure drop and fan power required to uh, uh, to uh, to provide you know HEPA filters in a building. Uh, they said if the HEPA filters aren't going to fit in uh, most of these ancient air handling units, so um, it's a challenge uh, due to budget. You know, maintenance uh, staff is you know often, particularly in you know public institutions, very. Uh, understaffed and underfunded. Uh, so you've got equipment that is failed and maybe remain so for a while. You've got dampers that damper, you know, controlled um, uh, operators that, that don't work anymore. And sometimes they just get, you know, kind of locked in the closed or fully open position, wasting energy or not ventilating. You know, it's, you know, you never know what you're going to get when you walk into some of these mechanical rooms. Um, so, you know, the, the budget for maintenance and staff is, is we realize a, a big concern. Um, a potential benefit of, you know, COVID and the CARES Act is that there is funding available to upgrade some of these older systems now. It's just a matter of getting it and making sure it gets delegated to the right places. So that's a, a big challenge. Um, some other challenges with existing building are, you know, what kind of control systems are you really working with? Um, 
again, out in the 1960s type buildings, there's probably very limited, uh, limited to what maybe has been renovated and brought online over the you know past 20 years or so. Uh, but still, it's not very adaptable or, or able to be modified to you know combat some of these needs of increased humidity, increased temperature, increased ventilation. You know, maybe you can increase the ventilation, but you don't have the coil capacity to do so. Um, uh, oops, sorry, uh, looking more at the, the VAV type systems of the 90s, um, like Pat was saying, these are pretty flexible, adaptable systems in that you can adjust your, you know, your damper uh, uh, configuration to make more outside air and less return air. Um, and you typically have a control system, a, a building automation system that can be programmed to, um, you know, to have different operating schedules adjust based on occupancy with some minor enhancements of uh, control panels and points. So, um, uh, and a lot of the, you know, again, kind of more back to the 1960s type buildings, the, the, the poor facade and insulation and physical constraints to actually installing uh, new ductwork, you know, that's a huge limit um, to increasing ventilation. But uh, again, maybe increasing ventilation is not the right answer if you if you have poor distribution. Uh, it's not getting to the right places and actually mixing the space. Uh, so, just a lot of concerns. And uh, you know, the question is, you know, how do we, and how do we, you know, provide a strategy in these, some of these older buildings? Uh, and the answer, in a lot of cases, might be deployable systems, um, wall-mounted, ceiling-mounted, uh, unitary-type devices that can uh, number one uh, humidify the air. Uh, uh, clean the air and sometimes even a, a portable type system uh, can be wheeled from classroom to classroom based on where your, your major occupancy is for uh, that semester, say. Uh, and if there is poor distribution, you know, we've uh, had some success deploying uh, fabric ductwork systems connected to, say, a little energy recovery unit that can fit up in the ceiling and connect to a, a new, you know, louver in the window um, that gets some air exchange, gets some energy recovery and improves distribution. Um, and if your, your building is so equipped with, an, with a central AHU system or pumping system for hydronics, you can always vary those speeds. These are pretty um, deployable solutions that can be you know, inserted into some of these more ancient type systems. So there are options out there. It's just a matter of uh, how, you, how you fit those in here. Um, yeah. One that I, yeah, go ahead, Pat. I'm just gonna say that I think, you know, from talking to a lot of different facilities folks um, at different universities, the, I think the the portable air cleaner was actually a pretty popular solution, and um, we the three of us, John and, and Brian, were talking about this. And you know, from a sustainability standpoint, and uh, you know how I think one of the biggest uncertainties is is how how persistent is this going to be? I mean, I think we all understood that it, we've gone a year; it's just gone on a lot longer than we probably thought it would. We're it's not going to end anytime really soon, but but is this pandemic going to be something that's going to be ongoing for the next, you know for a similar mode for the next 50 years or is this a, a you know a time of crisis that will you know have a, a 15 20 25 year span in between it and i think the you know where we'll 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 learn what the right solution is 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 when we understand what that that scenario looks like right and and so if it's if we are talking about you know two to one to two year kind of periods of pandemic then deployable might be the right solution because a lot of the systems we put in place are 25 year, 30 year systems. And why are you going to put in systems that are going to, you know, may never even see a pandemic and, and cost a lot of energy. So, so some of these things, like you put a HEPA filter in and you, you know, attach it to fabric ductwork and, and even do it in a room system. It's something that you could, we could think about um, as we move forward, how to, uh, how to clean up some of these, these older buildings without, you know, going through major, major renovations of, of, uh, of the buildings. Yeah, great point. Um, so with that, why don't you uh, continue you know, talking about uh, the humidity concerns that um, ASHRAE has, you know, brought upon us. Uh, you and John yeah. want to talk about that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, again, you know, it's not, we think that humidification is, is, a, is a, and John said it earlier, is, is a topic that should be talked about more, and you know we we should find ways to uh, to humidify buildings. But some of the recommendations that are are being put out there for forty to sixty percent humidity, I think there's a good amount of architects on the phone today, and 
and you know how if we do that in the northeast we're going to start growing ice on the windows so if we get above you know 40 to 50 percent i don't think the solution is to start growing mold in the building it's um you know we want to we want to be tempered with our um with our responses and and do things that are, are pragmatic and you know aren't going to have other consequences so so I think, you know, a lot of these, these recommendations are, are good, but the, you know, the hospitals, the FGI guidelines, we talked a little bit about earlier, those, um, those settled on above 30% RH, you know, for, for hospital buildings, uh, having done hospitals in, you know, buildings that were built by others. I do know that even at 30% RH in the, in the Northeast with the wrong window type, you can get frosting on the windows. Um, so, you know, the thermal envelope and, you know, really what the, what the, uh, what the, the answer is, you know, maybe humidification. And John had an interesting point that it could be good to, to go through for office spaces. Yeah. So one idea that I haven't, I've just been exploring it initially, but, you know, for office buildings, I mean, it's very rare for an office building to have uh, humidity control in the winter time, you know, in a cold climate. Um, but one thought that I've been talking about with some colleagues and designers is, what if you provide just isolated areas? Because, you know, not everybody is going to be as sensitive to humidity as some people are. So maybe one of the things that will happen in the future is in like when you're in a workspace, there will be some percentage of the population that you understand is are more susceptible to dry, uh, to infections when they're in dry um, situations, right? And so maybe there's just, you know, a thousand square feet on each floor that's, that's, you know, interior space that you can put a vapor barrier around and you can say, listen, this is where the people who are more sensitive and maybe more susceptible, this is where they can spend a good part of their work day. And it might help, help with their health and wellness without putting a huge burden on the energy costs and on the maintenance costs and even on the, you know, some of the failures that would cause, um, you know, that, that Pat's talking about that would actually potentially cause even more health issues, right? So, you know, those are the things, those would be interesting discussions over the course of the next year or two. And I, I agree, Pat, with what you said too. Like, I think we want to look at what are the short-term ways to, to do what we can. And then what are the long-term solutions that provide flexibility, but not, but aren't um, an overreaction to what the HVAC system can really do. Because one of the th point I'd like to make is, and you know, these, these guys all design hospitals too, right? So you know, when you did design an operating room, you know, you, the HVAC system is very important from an infection control perspective. But if the surgeon doesn't wash his hands or if the, if the instruments aren't clean, the HVAC system can't do anything, right? And so there's all these other protocols that have to happen for a building to be healthy. And it just, it can't just rely on the HVAC system to magically clean the air and make everybody healthy. It's a really important thing to keep in mind regardless of the building type. So we try to um, you know, put a little humor in here, but I'm trying to explain filters, you know, I think a lot of people are hearing about different MERV ratings for filters. So, so we were coming up with the MERV 8, which is pretty common in a lot of buildings for kind of the recirc units. Um, those are, you know, similar to the guy that, you know, he may have his nose hanging out of the, the mask uh, you see at the grocery store. It's, it's okay, um, you know, in a normal environment, but you, you should upgrade it to the MERV 13, uh, which is, you know, kind of probably in a similar analogy to um, putting on a cloth mask. No, not really the, the full N95, but, you know, a good, good protective mask. And then, you know, the HEPA filters, there are limitations in a lot of office buildings to, you can't just slap a HEPA filter onto a, uh, any sort of room device that has to be on a more of a centralized, you know, kind of bigger motor air handling unit. Um, but if you are able to use the HEPA filter, I mean, we, we do, I've done a few uh, biocontainment labs and if it's good enough to catch a bowl on the way out, it's, you know, it's pretty much good enough to catch um, a lot of the, the stuff, you know, with COVID or, or other viruses in a building at, at 0.3 microns, it catches 99.97% of the, uh, the, you know, anything going through it. So, so that's really, you know, a great solution. And, and if um, in a research environment, it's a good deployable solution without necessarily upsizing the amount of outdoor air to the building, which has, you know, chiller sizes and you know, a lot of other kind of downstream uh, implications. 
Uh, yeah, good, good point, Pat. I want to add a little bit to that in that. Um, uh, so MER filtration is, you know, it's kind of tested down to the 0.3 micron range. We know that these filters are tested in a, in a range of particle size that is um, kind of in line with where COVID droplets are at. So um, we as, you know, I think industry-wide people would agree that, you know, if these filters are a pretty um, effective way at capturing um, airborne viruses and uh, it's important to note that now, you know, MERV 13 technology, it is the ASHRAE recommendation. It's pretty much in all new buildings, um, but it's even available in one inch and two inch uh, depth filters, which can fit in some of the older school building filter racks without too much of a pressure drop penalty. So it's, a, it's also a deployable strategy. Um, other, you know, strategies that are, you know, kind of standalone type, uh, type things, the UV systems, you know, we're all well aware that um, these are on the market, you know, it's, I think it's a challenge of, you know, for your, your engineers and uh, facilities staff to figure out what works best in your building. Um, one type that we know is proven, we know works is the UV, you know, the high wattage UV systems that you find in uh, air handling units. Uh, these are intended to, you know, basically blast the coils and your filters with, um, uh, with high intensity UV light to kill any uh, germs on the on those uh, devices inside your air handling unit. You could also put them inside ductwork, but uh, the key is a long exposure time to the light. Uh, some of the more gimmicky type things that are out there on the market and getting installed all over the place are, you know, things where you know you've got, uh, you know, on Amazon you can buy a you know seventy dollar you know air purifier that has a UV light in it, but is the UV light really doing it anything, or is it the filter that's inside the unit? Uh, you know, our bets would be on the filter, but um, uh, certainly UV lights, you know, they can kill things that are kind of stuck on the, the face of the filter that get trapped. Um, so not, a, not all, always a bad thing, but is it the right type of filter? Is it the uh, right type of light? Is it uh, strong enough to, and, and the uh, exposure time through these units is usually about a half a second, not the, you know, four to 12 seconds that are required to actually be effective. Um, some of the room side uh, options that are out there is, you know, there's fan companies that, you um, uh, direct UV light up into the ceiling. You know, it's not clear whether or not how effective that is, but it is UV light kind of upper room UV is a, is a thing um, where you're not directly, you know, shining light on people because it's, you know, perceived it's, it's dangerous, uh, obviously. Um, but there are, you know, new technologies that, you know, called far UV light. It's a particular wavelength of, you know, high intensity UV that uh, that is safe for, for people. It is being used. Uh, there's, you know, it's one of the areas I think where, uh, more testing and, and studies and you know, ASHRAE recommendations are not quite there yet, but that, that might be the future of, of one technology where that's out there. Um, one thing I, that we haven't really talked much about yet, and I uh, don't really have this space in, in the next couple of slides either, but bipolar ionization. I, mean, I don't have a slide for that, but it's, it's not something that ASHRAE has kind of been promoting, but it's, a, you know, it's basically a technology um, that can be employed in a ductwork system, an existing ductwork system. Uh, in which you, there's a device, you know, basically like a hockey puck size thing that you install in the ductwork. It emits positively and negatively ion, charged ions into your air distribution system. Um, and those attach to, you know, viral particles that are in the airstream, you know, not killing them necessarily, but, you know, um, deactivating them and bringing them down to uh, the surfaces. And um, so it, it's been, we actually have it in our office right here. So um, uh it, it can help, but it's just that there isn't enough testing and studies on that also um, for ASHRAE to back it. I think there's just different uh, methods of testing that need to be uh, developed and standards. Um, so with that, you know, so we've, we've touched on a bunch of the different, you know, options, humidity, um, UV filters. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about ventilation, but what is the new norm uh, for ventilation? You know, increased ventilation is believed to reduce, re, uh, reduce transmission, but you know, in existing buildings, is air distribution effective to do so? You know, they're still unclear as to the effect of air distribution on, uh, on viral uh, reduction. Um, uh, old buildings, particularly, you're stuck with what you have. You know, here on the, the left side, we've got a picture of an office, a typical office setting, small ductwork, low air volumes. Um, on the right, we've got kind of the opposite, the, you know, the big, you know, supersized lab system. Um, for like a chemistry lab, which can be up to 10 air changes per hour. Um, the four to six air change range is, is kind of where, you know, we see laboratories is, is common practice, but it also seems to be where the trending office recommendations, not necessarily from ASHRAE, but, you know, a lot of different sources are, are recommending that for viral, um, 
um, defense. So it, is that the way, where we're trending from off our offices going to become, you know, basically the laboratories with respect to ductwork design and ductwork size and fan size and AHU size. And uh, it's a thing, you know, as engineers, we need to caution about just both from an energy perspective and a size and cost perspective. So uh, I know Pat had some good thoughts on this as well. So I don't know if you want to weigh in here, Pat. Yeah, we, we, I think this is, you know, we said before the theme of we, I think we need to understand is where, should we design these spaces to be, to be able to pack them full of people with, you know, with COVID or should we, most offices are empty right now. So, you know, are people, even if we design the, the space to 10 air change rates, or is anybody still going to come into the, into the offices, you know? And I, I think that's still a to be determined um, kind of thing. And, and so I think that there's going to be a lot of discussion. The four to six is is shown to be effective in some of the studies that have been done, you know, for folks that if there's a COVID event um, within the space, it does look to uh, to reduce the amount of transmission within the space. So, so that's a real thing. And, and, you know, and then I, so the, the ventilation is important in the, uh, in protecting people. Um but I think, you know, the, the larger discussion is what are the costs to do this and, you know, what are the impacts and, and, you know, that's, I think, where the, where the conversation should be going in the next, um, you know, six months to a year. And uh, that, that was kind of the three, the four of us were, have been kicking that around that, that I think we, we know things that we're, are going to help with, um, with transmission and, and the, that started to come to light and ventilation is one of those things. It's just, um, what are the implications of that? And, you know, is that, is that the right thing to do? Um, okay, get, is this me again? Right. Yeah, this was intended to be kind of more yeah. of a group discussion, but yeah, feel free to kick it off. Okay. Um, the uh, so again, <laughs> we I think what we'll end up doing is putting together lists of pros and cons, right? And and looking at what what's what, you know, more ventilation, uh, dedicated outdoor air systems, um, higher air change rates, you know, I mean, restrooms, we've, we, it's a good one on air. That's, that's something to focus on, you know, increasing ventilation in restrooms, absolutely, you know, creating barriers between stalls, you know, no brainer. Um, so, you know, what's the pros and cons, which ones have huge energy impacts and then, you know, and then really is how much, you know, what, to what extent uh, should we be going for these things? John, or if you want to jump in here at all. But. Yeah, I, I, I think the only thing I'll add is um, one way that I've been trying to keep it simple is, you know, when you when we're really in a situation where the pandemic is causing a lot of problems, like you said, like how many people are going to the office. So another um, metric that I've seen lately is 30 CFM per person of outside air, right? And so in standard office spaces without getting into the calculations too much you know you're probably about half of that for the actual for the full occupancy but if you're at 50 percent occupancy you're going to be pretty close to 30 cfm outside air just with the hvac system you have so if you balance the occupancy with and match that up and it seems like most people of most organizations and institutions have been able to figure out ways okay how can we balance out the occupancy aspect of it to match it up with the HVAC systems and that way provide a healthy environment when people are in classrooms or in their workspaces or whatever. So I think that's a, there's another way of kind of doing that calculation. Yeah, very true. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, pros and cons and lists that'll be out there as we, you know, develop our trends towards, you know, what the right solution is and how do we transform some of these, you know, little old spaces into a uh, more useful, um, uh, adaptive spaces. Um, so in researching old comma school classrooms, um, I came across this image and, you know, it, but it, it, it in, in addition to being funny, it represents, you know, kind of a typical lecture hall um, scenario of an, one of these older buildings, um, which again, is just one of our, our bigger concerns. You know, how do you um, transfer, uh, transform this space into you know, a more digital hybrid learning space with smart HEPA systems and controls. It's just, uh, uh, it's tough to see when you've got, you know, the, the tight spacing, the lack of ventilation and, uh, uh, and, and poor, uh, poor facades. So 
Um, but it, it can be done. I know that our architectural peers on, on this call are, are working all, uh, you know, all over the place and trying to create spaces that are more like this, in which uh, it's, uh, this is obviously probably a, a new building and it's got you know, an HVAC system that can adjust up and down and adapt. But um, this is what we're you know, kind of going to be tasked with uh, providing um, is a, a hybrid solution, which um, can monitor, it can turn down, it can record, you know, what's going on, it can trend, it can adapt, it has a, a, a big tech system in there and an HVA system designed around that as well. Um, uh, but also the ability to turn up when this room gets filled up, maybe in the summertime, or, or maybe even open the windows up in the summertime if it's that kind of kind of room. So um, where facilities, you know, direct their budgets is, you know, to be determined, but much like, you know, how the classroom environment is going to look as far as, you know, how many people are there versus on a screen. So uh, a lot of this is you know, obviously developing technology, but we've got the, the tools available that we've kind of run through uh, today to, to work with and, you know, our industry will obviously adapt it just as well. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, the audience, this is one, one area where a lot of the architects on the call could probably weigh in on you know, how older classroom, work, how older type classrooms could actually be transformed into something like this. So maybe a, a discussion item for, for later. Um, but how do we make it work? Uh, you know, control strategies. There's, you know, uh, again, the, the 1960s buildings were kind of limited in what we can do. The 90s, there probably is a control system, uh, as I mentioned before, that could be modified. But um, the real question is, how do we work with or provide new uh, control systems that, uh, that, that focus, you know, new building strategies on monitoring and responding? Um, I know that resiliency and demand response has been kind of one of the you know buzzwords and trends of uh, modern modern buildings. Call it that 2010 to, to 20 era. Uh, we're designing things for you know major events um, that occur and trying to um, make a building adapt. Um, so we, obviously, one of the things that now needs to be factored into that is the uh, pandemic response. So that's a going to have to be a new trend that kind of gets lumped in with uh, demand response and resiliency. And uh, there's a lot of tools to do that. I don't know if uh, uh, John or uh, Pat had anything more to add on, you know, controllability and what you know, new things are out there as, uh, as tools for us. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the, um, thanks, Pat. Um, well, I, I think having um, air quality monitoring and, and and communicating that back to the occupants of the building and showing that there's like a process for making sure that the systems and however you've modified them to operate during a response time, that they have some level of confidence that it actually is working the way that it was intended to. So I think that's a really important part of how the control system can help give people peace of mind, which it, quite frankly is just as important from a health perspective as some of the other stuff that, that we're talking about. Yeah, I think that, I think the smart buildings will, this will probably start to push a lot of that smart functionality. I can see some of the comments, you know, occupancy sensors had them with the smartphones. I think that that visibility is going to be huge in the next, you know, coming, you know, using technology is looking at CO2. How does that equal good outdoor air and you know, trying to, trying to show that buildings are healthy. I think that's going to be, you know, something that'll be, be a trend to come. Um, another trend that is, you know, not going anywhere is, you know, particularly amongst this group, we've got a big, you know, energy focused uh, and energy cost focused in our, you know, um, university and campus uh, partners here, but, um, you know, can't forget about the, you know, the added costs. Um, I know, you know, John talked about this earlier, so I won't dwell on it, but, you know, adding ventilation, adding filters, you know, costs a considerable amount of money uh, per year, you know, not to mention all these, you know, if you've got a big building, 100 air cleaners and UV lights across the building, you know, how much is that all going to cost you? So uh, we do want to not just throw everything at the, at the building uh, that we can just to, uh, feel like we're doing a good job. We want to be mindful of the uh, energy costs and uh, weigh the pros and cons and, you know, use what we think will be most effective. Again, a lot of that's based on the, the type of building and program and, uh, and the, the way that you use the space. Um, you know, a lot of it, and we're kind of winding down in our, our presentation here. So uh, trying to bring focus back to, you know, what the bigger question is of, you know, where students are going to learn and live, you know, if we, if they're not at school, if they're not in these buildings, then you know, an unoccupied building is really not a sustainable building. It's just a waste of space that you have to pay to heat and cool. 
um, to you know some minimal level. So you know, I, I assume that uh, universities and uh, and other and inst institutions, offices want people back in the office so that they can you know be a productive uh, place. Um, so um, where this all you know kind of trends again is part of the the bigger discussion and uh, kind of leave it with with that and uh, uh, open it up to discussion and uh, rather final closing thoughts from uh, Pat or John. It's good. The only, the only thing I, I would say um, that I wanted to add in here is that one of the recommendations we're seeing from a lot of people are, is that, you know, make sure that your building complies with just with ASHRAE 62.1 and ASHRAE standard 55. And that most of the buildings before 1960 don't. So it'll be interesting to see over time if there at least is some um, uh, initiative and and our priority to get those older buildings to at least just comply comply with the minimum standards which have been out there for a long time. So that, that's something to think about. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I don't and I don't see a lot of reason to believe that these standards are going to drastically change. You know, if anything, you know, if our buildings truly are half as occupied as they were uh, this time last year. You know, maybe our system sizes will be coming down. The ASHRAE sixty-two point one ventilation rates will come down um, on a normal, call it you know, summertime day. But we may also need to you know design around the uh, the purge modes, the winter mode, the pandemic response, in which the systems still kind of need to be supersized. So we, we want to avoid that, but you know, make uh, smart decisions and again, kind of meet in the middle. Well, guys, thank you for. Um for the thought provoking presentation there, if, if anything, um, you know, that I took away from the presentation is that there are really a lot of considerations there, you know, even in all the different categories of strategies, there's a lot of intersection between them and there really isn't a silver bullet, but it's important to have owners and design teams having these detailed conversations about what the right solution is for each project. Now, um, I wanna remind everyone on the, um, the, that, that's in the audience that if you are looking for continuing education uh, credit uh, or a certificate, there is a link that's been posted in the chat. So please uh, go in there and uh, follow the link and just fill out your information for that. Um, now, you guys have alluded to this a few times during the presentation, but there's actually been a really healthy discussion going on in the chat about um, a lot of it has focused on control strategies and he touched on it towards the end. Um, I also kind of picked up on a theme through uh, your presentation about having to plan for dynamic systems, systems that can adapt to different uh, scenarios, whether it's, you know, like Brian, you said at the end there, in the summer versus flu season, or, you know, a, a short-term uh, purge mode versus, you know, regular operation. Um, so can you, uh, can you all kind of speak to any strategies that you're using on your projects now or the discussions you're having with university clients about how to make their buildings adaptive? Um, even you know, in the short term or the designs you're working on now that maybe are, are working um, towards construction, how you're, you're planning to make those systems adaptive. Sure, I maybe can jump in. And, and one of the things that we talked about a little bit is um, how to pull from some of the stuff we're doing in the lab side. So we're <laughs> one of the, the sectors that's still cranking along in Boston is, is the, the core shell lab buildings, which we build a ton of, of infrastructure into. And we, we basically make them modularized so that you can turn off, you know, you design the building for two CFM a square foot, but you might only ever use one CFM a square foot. And, and we've talked about to some clients about how do we, you know, maybe modularize these systems so that you can have some kind of, you know, purge capacity into, into, um, into academic settings and, you know, still have the building function properly during the, uh, the times that, um, that it's uh it's you know you're it's you know there's no pandemic but but on the other side um you're able to to have a little bit of, of extra capacity you know so do we add in a an extra kind of dx unit that 
injects outdoor air into a into into the you know supply air and um, or heat recovery you know device to to do that same thing centrally. I think those are, are interesting things to to think about in, in some of these classroom and you know in office buildings. Yeah, I mean, I, I can add to that in that, you know, a lot of the things we're, um, you know, we're definitely doing, we're, we're pushing more of the, you know, higher level filtration things and talking about all the options that, that we talked about here today. Um, some of them get, get implemented, some of them don't, don't but I, the key is, you know, having the discussion and, um, you know, being clear about what the, you know, what the effectiveness of some of these um, uh, solutions really is. Um, but, you know, filters and, and, designing your systems, you know, for, you know, uh, for the, those purge modes is kind of, you know, particularly in the laboratories, something that we need to be uh, focused on for now. Um, and, you know, we, you know, we had a lot of talk about controls there, you know, there's, there's a lot of options out there. I mean, I know there's even, you know, there's smart lighting systems that can kind of do a better job at sensing actually how many people are in the room versus just, you know, one single occupancy sensor. Um, so there's tech out there that, you know, is, is still developing. Maybe, you know, this, pandemic provides an opportunity for some of these newer um, technologies to get some exposure. So one of the other um, kind of themes that I, I took from the presentation was that, you know, there's a, kind of a baseline of just the basics that a building owner needs to take care of, um, you know, and then, you know, some of these strategies are all kind of building upon that, you know, that includes masking, for example. Um, but, you know, to John's point, you know, a lot of our college and universities are dealing primarily with an existing building stock. And just validating that your building is actually ventilating at the minimum code requirements would go a long way towards just trying to make sure that the building is is operating correctly. We we know, I think, as designers, there's what we design, and then there's reality and how the how the buildings will operate. Um, so, can you, uh, you you spoke to this a bit earlier, but um, the dynamic between new buildings or major renovations or, or big retrofits versus um, what we do in existing buildings? What do we do? You know, you know, campuses have millions of square feet. What are they going to do in 2021, 2022 when, when students come back on campus? Yeah, so, and this actually is kind of in line with one of the questions I see there in the chat. You know, how do you, how do you communicate with the general public, you know, coming back to campus on how to know if their building is safe? And, um, you know, the answer lies within, you know, I'll, I've been kind of focused on the existing buildings, but um, there's not a lot of control systems and control systems are expensive to implement. So, um, but there are, you know, standalone packaged things and, and um, controls that you can add to your air handling unit to monitor and measure the amount of outside airflow. That is something that can be retrofitted and, uh, and monitored for, for flow that actually goes through the building. Um, uh, the problem comes again with, you know, is this di distribution being uh, effectively balanced throughout the space? So, you know, rebalancing some of these buildings is, is probably in order. Um, uh, but there are, you know, smart building, um, you know, dashboards that you can put out the front of the building that does link data from your, you know, from your central system that says, okay, it's a, it's a comfortable, you know, the outside air condition is, is um, safe to be or, or comfortable to be brought in the building. So today we're at 100% outside air and you've got, you know, X air changes um, and, you know, people can feel good about that. Um, and maybe not so much in the winter time when the energy costs skyrocket. So at that point, it becomes a, a balance. Uh, but there are tools out there to, uh, to identify how the building's operating and putting it on a dashboard to let people know. Good, yeah. John. I've, I've, seen a, I've seen a lot of uh, our clients are having balancers come in and just to verify that they're getting the outside air from their air handling systems that you know was in the design intent, right? But you know, people want that um, verification now, just, you know, to be able to show that and say, yeah, we can't, we had somebody come in and they actually measured it. And so measuring the amount of outside air, measuring the air quality, I think that that's the best way to give kind of just the general public some peace of mind.
So uh, Paula, you know, brings up in the chat uh, kind of an equity issue, and this actually relates to some of the earlier chats uh, where the discussion about, and actually Paula kind of started it in the chat, uh, everyone has a phone on them, you know, what about having a phone be your occupancy sensor control, um, which, you know, in some of our other BSA SCUP events, um, we've talked about how there, there are are equity issues, um, even just assuming everyone's going to have a 5G capable phone, um, you know, is a presumption. And if it relates to the safety of the space that they're that they're they're occupying, that could be an issue. But then Paula also brings up how do you manage, you know, the disparity in owners that have money versus those that don't. You know, we've got you know the wealthy universities, the the ones that are operating on a shoestring. Uh, budget and you know I think a lot of those kind of basic base level um, strategies that that you've all talked about could be you know those starting points those relatively cost effective strategies you also talked about a couple of times synergies between energy savings like operational energy savings uh, and then uh, and some of these strategies. Could you speak to, to the operational side um, in terms of how, you know, an upfront investment might be able to pay for itself and accomplish both health and energy strategies? Sure. Uh, I think maybe in the, you know, starting off with the, the inequity uh, part of, of things, I think that's part of the reason we're trying to be tempered with our responses. Um, we don't want to set the bar, you know, at a point that's unreasonable for buildings to be at. And uh, I think we want to be, you know, um, we want to be reasonable with with the responses and 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 really, um, you know, Brian had those classrooms up. I mean, the hybrid learning, and you know, John talked about if if we're in a hybrid learning environment and you have less people in a classroom, you know, all of a sudden your HVC system just got a lot better than it was when you packed it full. So. Um, from a retrofit, I, there is money out there right now in the stimulus, um, how it's distributed. I hope that's equitable, uh, in terms of, of, um, of access to those funds. And, but there's a big opportunity for energy savings and, you know, in doing good with, and, you know, <laughs> having those replacing old systems that aren't energy efficient with, uh, with new heat recovery systems, you know, taking advantage of that money and, and make inputting in uh, energy efficient systems, I think. It's an opportunity. I think there will also be some more discussion about filtration in lieu of uh, ventilation. That, that was a big discussion point for a little while within the ASHRAE community. And I think that that's gonna come back around because I think studies will be done to say, hey, if the filtration is at a high enough level Maybe we don't need these high levels of um, of outside air, and that would be that would be win win if it's, if it's cleaner air and it's uh, less energy. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I was going to say something to that point too. It's it you know it's going to come down to a, a payback you know analysis. You've it's it's very expensive to input new central systems and energy recovery systems versus sticking with what you've got, filtering that air, and making sure the you know, the little amount of air, smaller amount of air that's coming into your spaces is clean and safe. And, uh, um, you know, that, that can all be monitored and trended, but it, it does require a, a huge, you know, effort on the, the, the facility staff to get those you know, filters cleaned and because uh, that does, uh, yeah, it does have an effect. Well, we are at time now. So again, I want to thank you on behalf of uh, the audience and on behalf of BSA SCUP for um, great presentation, great discussion, uh, a lot of um, valuable thought and experience that, that you shared with everyone today. So thank you for that. Um, for the audience, I want to remind everyone, uh, we have one more session coming up. Um, so uh, actually, if uh, whoever's sharing the screen can stop and the new show will share again. So we have one final session coming up in 15 minutes. So everyone, you know, you can take a break, uh, come back, uh, and we'll start right at three o'clock. The next presentation is a uh, case study of a project in construction now that actually brings together a lot of the strategies 
for healthy uh, health and wellness design that we've talked about over these first two hours. Uh, this is a case study uh, designed by Wilson HGA, uh, now HGA Architects, um, and uh, my team at Vanderweil, and it's a case study in healthy laboratory design and healthy design for a campus. So uh, thank you. Reminder, last chance in the chat uh, for that link uh, to, to get your continuing education credits. I just put that in there. Um, but otherwise, we will see you all in 15 minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick.